Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Alliance Live, the online information and learning portal showcasing examples of innovative and integrated working taking place across Scotland within health and social care. We continue the series of these 30 minutes webinars focusing on service design and how the Scottish Government do service design through a live presentation and Q&A presented by Samantha Ernson from the Digital Transformation Service. Sam has worked in user-centered design space for the past 15 years, mostly in the private sector. The past two have been spent with Scottish Government, leading a small team to build service design delivery through their Digital Transformation Service. Sam's personal projects include working on digital licensing with SEPA and SNH and evolving disability benefits to Social Security Scotland. As Sam delivers her presentation, we invite the audience to post to pose questions using the chat box which is found within the toolbar. This will make up the questions for the Q&A session, which will follow on the presentations and bring our webinar to a close. Now, without further delay, over to Sam. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick presentation that kind of gives a bit of an introduction to the service design approach, what is service design, and also the approach that we're taking within uh, Scottish Government. Um, just trying to move the slide, one second. So I think the first question that we often get asked is um, how do we define a service? And I think if there's anything that service design um, does is it really helps to start lift the people's view from um, a process or a set of processes to actually see what a, the service view is for their clients. So I think if you were starting on your first journey or first foray into service design, just trying to understand what the service view is of your product is a really important thing to do. When you're thinking from that service lens, you'll be able to see all of the systems that your users engage with, and in fact unearth all of the users that actually engage with your service. And that's really the view that the service designer really needs to take. And by doing this is a naturally inclusive design approach. So the service design approach is making sure that you're including everybody by way of just the view and the lens that you take. The second question we often get asked is what is design? So this is a tool um, as well as a kind of um, visual mechanic, which is often used to describe the design process. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, it's called the double diamond. And it's a really simple way of understanding the kind of um, route that we might take, service designer might take in order to help um, an organization facilitate um, the work that they want to do and what we often find is that the first thing that organizations have not done is understood the problem space and that is exactly where the service designer really starts so by taking a service view of the product or organization and really understand what your users are experiencing or can experience, you really start to understand and unearth what are some of the issues and problems that people face. Um, what we experience with a lot of organizations is that they've already decided the solution that they want to implement and they already feel that they understand the problem, but all too often that problem is only understood through the lens of the organization or business and not from the users. So this first part of the double diamond is the part that we encourage people to spend, I think, the longest time in. And really, if we're not starting with understanding what the problems are, we won't know whether we've solved those problems by the time we've finished the project or implemented the solution. So this really, by not just understanding your users' issues, the way your users experience things, it's really important also that service designers establish what the kind of, um, what I like to call the moments of truth in the journey, where we can start to measure the impacts that we're actually having, because we know how to measure 
and to, to to understand that we've solved the problems that we we've actually um, understood. The second part is really second and third is really where the designing starts to take place. And I'll talk about some of those um, approaches in a moment, but very often we will go through as after this sort of discovery phase and understanding the, the problems, this is where all the ideas take place in part two, which is defined. So we will start prototyping and coming up with ideas and using co-design, uh, which is working with users to sometimes come up with those ideas with users, sometimes um, kind of validating those ideas with users. And those, don't be afraid of doing that part of the process. Um, at this stage of part two, it's all about volume. No idea is a bad idea. And it's really trying to understand the landscape that your solutions could potentially take and co-designing that with your users, which if you've understood the problem space, you've understood the users of your service, you'll know who you need to work with in order to design it. All too often in this stage, you won't get the answers, but you will definitely get an, a clearer understanding of the kind of things that you're going to need to design in order to um, get a solution or very often a number of solutions to your problem. Stage three is um, the development, and that's really about the, a more formal way of usability testing and um, prototyping your ideas in more realistic situations. So that could take place anything from, um, if you're designing a digital artifact, doing some testing of wireframes, uh, just some sketches to making those um, wireframes functional through to actually testing that wireframe in the situation that a client might actually be using it and trying to um, either recreate um, as best you can the actual environment and as much of the journey that you can. For example, if we were creating some um, written communication that could be sent to clients, instead of just putting them uh, those communications in front of a client as a, a participant as a test and to see what they think of that letter, we might take the time to mock that letter up on the headed paper and send it to the client uh, so that they can see how they experience that when they receive it actually through the post on their own doormat. And the fourth part of the double diamond is called deliver. And in reality, by going through process steps one to one to three, you're really going to be understanding what it is you need in order to deliver your your product. What needs to be in place? What number of features um, do you need to create, and and how do you deliver it? So it's really important that um, in that you move through that double diamond, especially um, points one to three, because. We know that normally um, most organizations will start in um, the second diamond and they start with develop and deliver and really miss out um, points one and two. So the double diamond is a really useful tool to actually help visualize for an organization where they actually are. <clears throat> so some of the key elements of service design and service designers work uh, in Scottish government. There are a lot of different roles associated with service design that help um, facilitate service design which I'll talk through in a moment but the kind of key elements of service design there's about four um, things that we always make sure are contained um, and that are built into Scottish approach which um, if I've not emphasized already um, service design really is about making things user-centered. And that's not just for what people would refer to as an end user, like a client. It's anybody that touches anything that you've made within uh, any of your processes or any of your literature. So that can include um, people who do uh, behind the scenes processing. It could be people who open mail in a mail room. It's really all the users that are included in your service are important to design for. We spend a lot of time understanding um, and working with the user researchers to look at 
how we can best define and build a service. So as I've just desi- uh, sort of talked about going through that double diamond, the fidelity of that research and the types of engagements that we do will change um, as we go through that double diamond um, approach. At the start, it will be a lot more explorative and um, things like interviews and um, more group sessions, moving through to more idea-based sessions and then looking at other ways that we can actually understand um, user behavior. So we will also use quantitative um, data where it's available in order to help us understand where we might need to focus our efforts um, and where we might need to um, do more design because there's a real issue in a particular area. Um, But it's really looking at, um, in the first two stages, getting the right blend of quantitative and qualitative research to define your problem, to then know what to design in order to solve it. I've already talked about the importance of co-design, and this is where the inclusive approach is really just natural to service designers. So we don't really talk about... Um, inclusive design as a separate thing because if you take a service design approach you're naturally taking an inclusive service design approach now there are a lot of challenges uh, around that and in Scottish government we're working hard to help try and build some tools and techniques to help or tools and approaches I would say to really try and help ensure that um, we can actually co-design services with every for every user um we've just cut i'm just working on um social security uh, disability benefits so we've worked with lots of different users uh with lots and lots of different needs so it's not just about creating workshops with lots of post-it notes and sticking things up on the walls we've really had to think long and hard about how we Um, reach users um, that have particular needs which has been a real I think as a service designer I kind of relish in that challenge it's exciting for me and I'm always um, get quite excited when especially when I am working with people using assistive technology I'm always like totally astounded at how people navigate the world using these tools and um, has really helped shape actually the um approach that we've taken um, in for quite a lot of things. An, ex- an example where service design and user research, so we do work a lot with user research and we have, a, I'd say there's a healthy tension between the two roles. User researchers, their role is really understanding, obviously understanding the user, which the service design ne- designer needs, but in terms when it comes to the looking at the ideas and trying to generate ideas, a service designer is more likely to look at the extreme users of a service so identifying those extreme users is really important so either somebody who i i would describe an extreme user as somebody who um either engages with the service already a lot a lot higher than you would anticipate the norm or doesn't engage with the service at all um an example that i sort of use um, is that if you were trying to design, I'm trying to use a sort of totally product-led example, if you were trying to design a new deodorant, you might not just talk to people um, who just use deodorant every day, you're going to talk to people who use deodorant multiple times a day, or people who don't use deodorant at all. And that's really, when it comes to that define phase and it comes to the ideation, part of um, the service design in part two of the double diamond that's where your extreme users really can help you um, formulate some really exciting ideas and really get you to um, a bit of a different place than you would do just keep talking to uh, regular users of your service so it's really important um, as I've kind of expressed already moving through that double diamond that the the approach to service design is about iteration. Um, and that is, we're always moving ideas from one step to the next. I think organizations feel really uncomfortable with this. They want you to land on an idea and that be the idea. Um, and often when you're in that part two phase of the double diamond, 
people think, yeah, we've got some great ideas. This is what we just want to design and develop. And you really have to be not attached to those ideas because a lot of them will fall by the wayside. Um, it's really just facilitating a deeper understanding those ideas at that phase. Um, and it's really in part three where you become more um, wedded to some of those ideas and feel that those ideas are actually going to be what the ones or the one that you go and develop. So iteration, I think, from an organisational point of view, is really hard for people to um, get their heads around because people like to get to an answer as quickly as possible. So we really try and do a lot of work with organisations to um, keep them calm and not worry about that iteration stage because it is really messy and you sometimes you think you're taking one step forward and you take two steps back but um it's a really important thing to kind of trust that process that you will end up with something um at the end of it and the more iteration you can build into your approach the better um, Hopefully I've emphasized already the collaborative nature of everything that we do. So we are always in public sector when we look at how we're often looking at the problems when we're defining problems um, with users is it's not just about one thing or one organization, it's multiple. So it's really important that not do we just design these things in a collaborative way with users, there's also a massive um, kind of engagement piece that we do with the organisations themselves um, so that they can in the future um, kind of widen their lens and really widen their perspective on what they do and what they're here to do. And this really kind of leads into why it's a little bit more unique in public sector because um, clients and customers are normally interacting with multiple organizations but from a client's point of view they've normally just got one problem and some of the biggest things that we come across um, is that when we're working with organizations they're not really working hard enough to take a bigger view of what they're actually doing and they're really only looking at their little bit of the, the process so that's why it's really important for um, service design to go in and try and break down some of those um, barriers so that we get to a more straightforward um, solution for all the users involved. So we've been working on um, a Scottish approach to service design, which really I'll just introduce you guys to, but it's really trying to um, bring together everything that service design is and create a way that's a little bit um, more standardized in government that we can actually help people um, develop those tools and capabilities within their own organization. We've developed seven principles of service design, which we are co-designing with all of our um, clients at the same time. So I like to say we, you know, we're eating our own dog food as we're doing it. We have started off with these principles, which are really based around, you know, collaboration, iteration, understanding the problem space, all the things that we know are really core to creating not just service design, but also service design capabilities in organizations. And I've talked about, oh, there should be one more slide. I've talked about that um, service design is just one role within um, kind of the user-centered design space. And I just wanted to introduce some of the other roles to you so that you kind of see the, the length and breadth of service design and where it kind of touches. And quite often we are the gate people either start with getting a user researcher in or they might start with getting a service designer in but when you start to do user-centered design quite often you will need um, kind of a small multidisciplinary team to try and help um, facilitate what you're trying to design and one of the things that we're trying to um, trying to demonstrate 
um, in government is how when you get a multidisciplinary team together, you actually get a much better result than if you just have a user researcher or a service designer. But it is true, a service designer does kind of facilitate a lot of the overall design of things. But the reality is that we will work with more specialized design um, practices in order to refine the approach. Um, so one of the most uh, important, quite often everything we do has content <laughs> involved in it. And that's not just writing words, it's how we design the communication and content artifacts across the journey. So that's done, done and facilitated by content designer and content strategist. Um, quite a lot of the time, there's a lot of visual elements to what we do. So we interface with graphic designer, a graphic designer when we need something that's a bit beyond our own visual capabilities. Interaction design, some people might recognize that as user experience, um, but that's really um, understanding how interactions um, need to work in a digital space. So they might get involved in um, prototyping digital artifacts. Um, service designer, which obviously talked about quite a lot. A technical writer could be if you are um, so in social security, we do a lot of trying to translate le um, legislation um, so that it's digestible for all the users of that service, including the people who process that. So that would be a technical writer that could help facilitate that. And obviously, a user researcher is somebody that um, service designers work very closely with to help facilitate that understanding of all of the different user needs and, and user issues. So I think that's me just two minutes over sorry about that guys but um, i'm happy to take any questions thank you very much sam so that brings us to the end of the presentation presentation section and on to the q a portion of the webinar we have time for a couple of questions and i would like to start with this one which came in the chat box and we've already touched upon this so service design is about organizations coming together to solve problems especially as people who will be navigating services from many providers um, can you tell us about any examples where this is happening in Scotland, where people have been breaking down organizational silos and barriers and working together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's, it's a really tough one, but we, we're trying very hard. <laughs> so um, at the moment, we are trying to help uh, Police Scotland, uh, Crown Prosecution Service and... Um, and digital are coming together to try and create a way of digitizing evidence um, for the use of all of the different agencies that need to use that. So that's one um, quick, quick example. Um, we're also trying to, the, the project that we did with um, CEPA and SNH are um, two very different organizations, both with very similar needs around creating licenses to permit citizens and organizations to do um, specific activities. So working, we have to facilitate that working together. They're not naturally working together. Um, planning and architecture, where we work with local authorities and planners to come up with a uh, a more seamless planning service um, and even within social security working with local authorities working with uh, health boards working and, and NHS to really help ensure that if we need to collect any information about our client um, to support the application we can do that in a really straightforward way so the client doesn't have to run around and collect lots of things um, so, yeah, that's a couple of examples. Hopefully that's answered your question. Thank you very much. Um, and we also had a similar question coming in over email. Um, and Hilda from Cove was wondering if it would be possible to provide some links for further reading of mm -hmm. examples like this, especially around mental health and how service design was done, who is involved, and so on. Mm -hmm. for, ment for projects that... So just links to further reading. Okay, so we could, there's definitely further reading around service design. Um, I think I'm just trying to think of anything around that specifically touches on um, that might be relevant. 
I'll have to have a think about it. So like we haven't we're starting to create some case studies to try and help people sort of see how service design and user centered design actually I should say have kind of um, manifested in different organizations. So I can definitely share some of those with you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and another question. So most third sector organizations cannot afford or fund to have all the digital data and technology professions mm. uh, as employees within the organization. How can they still secure the right staff mix to do service design? Can some of these roles be combined maybe, or are there any small steps that they can start with? Yeah, I, I really think that I, I totally appreciate the cost restriction associated with these roles because a lot of people will come with very specific experience, which obviously comes with a demand of, um, money attached to it um i think the, the it seems like a small step but actually i think it's a very big step that if you start um with looking at your whatever you're doing whatever the project is or whether you're whether it's your organization and really being able to take a service view um the first slide that i started with understand who are all your users and how are they using your service and what are the moments of truth that are really important to them? Um, that would be the first thing that I think is a really important step because you, even just doing that exercise will um, unearth, even if you did that internally and then took that out to users of your service to see how they kind of um, view what you've done and um, add some more kind of um, detail to it. I think just that in itself really starts to not just open your eyes, but also some of your senior um, management, um, their perception of what they're doing starts to grow a lot bigger and they'll, they'll start to see opportunities to tie up. And I think that's, for me, the most powerful thing in service design that we're trying to help people see the things from a user's perspective. And I think that's where the visualization comes in, but it doesn't have to be beautiful. It can, we work a lot with big bits of brown paper and um, lots of post-it notes or just, you know, drawing it out like a big grid. We often, the biggest thing that people do is they don't think about the service from the user's point of view and doing that really does open your eyes. So that'd be my first recommended action to take. And the second would be take it to users to try and start building on it. Okay, um, well, thank you very much, Sam. That brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, so thank you for delivering the fantastic presentation and answering the questions from our audience. We hope that this webinar has provided some insight and takeaways to bring to your own organizations and we'll follow up with links to the case studies and further reading as well. So a big thank you to everyone who registered for the webinar. We, have, we hope to have you join for our next one as well, which will take place on the 3rd of December with Dr. Hannah Fields, Senior Policy Officer here at the Alliance, and Dr. Diane Dixon, Service User Experiences Research Officer at Self-Directed Support Scotland. The webinar will cover the development of the My Support My Choice research project and next steps. More information is available on the website. Thank you very much. <laughs>